Good morning. Welcome to Community Unitarian Universalist Church Online. My name's Tom Reed, and I'm the worship associate for today's service. I'm sitting here on my lovely patio, and you may hear some background noises from time to time, but wishing we were all together in our familiar sanctuary. But in this time, let us all be grateful for the chance to worship together through any means necessary. Our church, like all Unitarian Universalist congregations, is founded on a common vision rather than a required creed. The belief we share is the conviction that every single person on earth has inherent worth and dignity and deserves to be treated with kindness. And the mission we share is to nourish spirits, work for justice, and transform lives. At Community Unitarian Universalist Church, all means all. We welcome your joy, your sorrows, your full personhood, and your broken places. Curiosity and fear, seeking and finding, knowing and dreaming. Thank you for joining us online when we cannot join in person. Thanks also to the many doctors, nurses, medical workers, and scientists who've given so much of their time, effort, and love, especially right now. Thank you to the essential workers who keep the machinery of daily life, like grocery stores, shipping lines, humming along so that others can stay safe. And finally, thank you to all our neighbors and friends here and everywhere who have shown in great ways and small that we're committed to taking care of each other. For as long as the coronavirus isolation orders are in place, stay in touch by watching our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, and our website. If you need support, please reach out to our caring committee through the email address ecares, that's E-C-A-R-E-S, at communityuuchurch.org. Just because we have to be physically separate doesn't mean we can't be close. Our speaker today is Reverend Chris Cervantes, Community's Consulting Minister. Chris received her Master of Divinity degree and Certificate in Sexual and Gender Justice Studies from Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth. She lives in a little brick house with her husband, Robert, son, Gabriel, and a variety of four-legged family members, as well as lots of books and dog hair. Her older son, Jack, studies printmaking and fine arts at the University of North Texas. In her spare time, Chris reads everything, paints, sings, talks to her garden, and drinks far too much coffee with friends, although these days, that's over Zoom. Thanks, and again, Welcome to Community UU Church. Our opening words this morning are from May Sarton. Come out of the dark earth, here where the minerals glow in their stone cells, deeper than seed or birth. Come into the pure air, above all heaviness, of storm and cloud to this light-possessed atmosphere. Come into, out of, under the earth, the wave, the air. Love touch us everywhere with primeval candor. Our community knows no. We are not confined by the physical limits of walls, or for that matter, of what often binds us, restricts us, holds us back. We are freer than we know when we release ourselves and each other from expectations of what is needed for true community. We are here, together, in space. I see you, I hear you, I love you. And I light this chalice, a beacon of this community, holding us all together here, now. Our covenant is the tie that joins Unitarian Universalist congregations, communities and individuals together 
in a web of interconnection, even when we must connect over physical distance. The practice of promising to walk together is the core of our faith. Please join me now in repeating our congregational covenant. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in freedom, and to help one another. Circle round for freedom, circle round for peace, for all of us imprisoned. Circle for release, circle for the planet, circle for each soul. For the children of our children, keep the circle whole. Circle round for freedom, circle round for peace, for all of us imprisoned. Circle for Circle for the planet, circle for each soul, for the children of our children, keep the circle begin our pastoral prayer today, I will share the words of Tish Nhat Hanh, though you can find them in our hymnal number 505. Let us be at peace with our bodies and our minds. Let us return to ourselves and become wholly ourselves. Let us be aware of the source of being, common to us all and to all living things. Evoking the presence of the great compassion let us fill our hearts with our own compassion towards ourselves and towards all living creatures. Let us pray that we ourselves cease to be the cause of suffering to others. With humility, with awareness of the existence of life and of the sufferings that are happening around us, let us practice the establishment of peace in our hearts and on earth. Amen. And so I would like to share prayers for those who I know are facing difficult times, which is all of us to some extent or another. Um, Spirit of life, we ask that for the sick and the infected, you heal them and sustain them, and that you allow um, their families and the medical practitioners to do their best to bring them along in comfort and in love. For vulnerable populations, we certainly ask the spirit of life to breathe into us and into those who are distributing resources. We know even as we grieve this global pandemic that here in the United States, it is already proven that justice is intermingled with everything because black and brown and indigenous people are getting the virus and having higher death rates three times the death rates in New York City. And so we know that even at this time, we cannot forget that justice is justice and that justice matters and that there is there are ongoing challenges to meet. As we think of the homeless and those who are um, just 
in the most vulnerable places economically, those without health insurance, those who cannot um, have all the uh, amenities to get around town that many of us have, protect them from abuse and from illness. For the young and the strong, I ask once more that they have the wisdom and the compassion to um, stay at home and be intelligent and smart and kind and compassionate and think beyond their inner circle to the whole intertwined circle of the world because we know that they can and indeed often do much better than the rest of us. For our local, state, and federal government and all the people working within it to bring this crisis into some kind of focus, um, I just simply, I call upon the spirit of life to fill our leaders with wisdom and compassion, compassion. I call upon us to make sure that our leaders are accountable as they move forward through this crisis and as they reach out to distribute um, resources and to care for everyone from the richest to the poorest, from the oldest to the youngest in this nation. And so I finally want to say a special word for all those on the front lines, our grocery store workers and the medical workers who maybe you don't see them all the time, but they're still essential personnel. They're at that hospital. They are um, cleaning up. They are the nurses aides. They are those people who are running around with papers and clipboards. They are working so hard and putting themselves at risk. And of course, for our medical personnel, like doctors and nurses who are on the front lines, and for the scientists who are working so hard to find some sort of a cure for this, to make us immune to it in the way that we've been so blessed to become immune to so many other things through the use of science and knowledge and compassion and insight. And so I just, spirit of life, grant them and us all inspiration and perseverance through this time of trial. Amen. Some hands have held the world together. Some hands have fought in wars forever. So tell me what shall I do? with these hands of mine Some hands have blessed a million people Some hands help free the world from evil So tell me what shall I do with these hands of mine What shall I do Shall I do with these hands of mine? The world could use a hero of the human kind. So tell me what shall I do with these hands of mine? Some hands must die for life. Comfort a baby crying. So tell me what shall I do with these hands of mine? What shall I do with these hands of mine? What shall I do with these hands of mine?
They give voice to a nation Some hands roll Oh, the times they are changing What shall I do With these hands of mine What shall I do Tell me what shall I do with these hands of mine? This morning's meditation reading is by Roberto Juarros. The bell is full of wind, though it does not ring. The bird is full of flight, though it is still. The sky is full of clouds, though it is alone. The word is full of voice, though no one speaks it. Everything is full of fleeing, Although there are no roads, everything, everything is fleeing toward its own presence. What a pleasure it is to be here this morning with you. Although I am recording on a morning that is not Sunday morning, I still have the vision of all of you in the shared space that we have I miss you so much. I just want to hug so many people and I want to shake all your hands and I know that I just can't do any of that right now. And so um, I am happy to be here virtually and picturing you out there virtually as well. So thank you so much. So this morning I submit myself to your tender mercies, a humble pastor trying to speak about half of our whole faith movement. So, Unitarian Universalism, I've always said, is the faith movement that's named after two theological heresies, neither of which you have to believe in to be a modern day UU. Actually, that's what I used to say when people asked me about the origins of our names. But, as I also often say, I reserve the right in perpetuity to change my mind, and I've changed my mind about that. What I hope to explore this morning is the doctrine of universalism, which says, long story short, that God's love is big enough and universal enough to save everyone. We'll do that by focusing on the gloriously named Hosea Ballou, a self-educated universalist preacher who spread the God is love gospel in the late 1700s and early 1800s in America. Brother Ballou was an interesting fellow who lived an interesting life, but for our purposes, we'll focus on a couple of the theological controversies in which he engaged with gusto. The idea of Jesus' death as an atonement for the sins of humanity, and the idea that God might condemn human souls to perdition. Ballou was born and raised a strict Calvinist. But in his early years, he was exposed to the doctrine of universal salvation, and apparently it hit him like one of the not-yet-invented freight trains. By the time he began his career as an itinerant preacher in 1791, he was a convinced universalist. In 1805, he published the book that would make his name, A Treatise on Atonement. So let's talk about atone atonement for a second. 
More specifically, I want to talk about penal substitutionary atonement, an idea still espoused in most Christian churches today. And here's how it goes. Because Adam and Eve ate of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, humankind has sinned infinitely against God. Because the nature of God is infinite and all-knowing, God knew humanity would do this. And so God also created, at the beginning of time, Jesus. Hmm. And an infinite mediator who would later, at a specific time and in a specific place, intervene on behalf of humanity. The reconciliation or atonement of humankind to an offended God could only be achieved through an infinite sacrifice in the same way that it was an infinite sin. And that infinite sacrifice would be the death of Jesus Christ, Son of God, upon the cross and his resurrection. And somehow the Holy Spirit is in there too. I am not a Trinitarian. I am a Unitarian who likes to engage with the Holy Spirit. Ballou was having none of that. He wrote, why the above ideas should ever have been imbibed by men of understanding and study, I can but scarcely satisfy myself. Their absurdities are so glaring that it seems next to impossible that men of sobriety and sound judgment should ever imbibe them or avoid seeing them. In his treatise on atonement, Ballou picked apart the pieces of the theory of penal substitutionary atonement. He said, First of all, we posit, supported by scripture, that God is love and that God is unchanging. But if we accept the common belief about atonement, we're saying God changed from being loving to being punishing when Adam and Eve sinned and then changed back to being loving when Jesus supposedly died for that sin and all others. So which is it, Hosea Ballou wrote? Is God unchanging or is God inconsistent? Next, Ballou attacked this idea that humans, being finite, could sin infinitely. Can't happen, he concluded, stupid to talk about, stupid to think so. So we're not gonna dwell much on that one. Finally, Jose Ballou came to what seems to me to be the most distasteful part of a frankly poisonous doctrine. The idea that God would knowingly condemn millions to eternal suffering because they happened to have been born before the crucifixion of Jesus, or in parts of the world where no one knows who Jesus is. Ballou wrote, for the sake of argument, let it be granted that God, being supreme, had a right to do so because he had the power. And he creates millions of beings whom he intends for endless torments and puts his whole design into execution. And this is called supreme goodness? In this case, I wish to know how a supreme evil might be described. Don't get me wrong. Ballou did think that humans are sinful and it's hard to read the newspaper today or check Twitter or Facebook or any other media and disagree with that. But Ballou was also certain that humans are loving and deserving of love. His whole faith was predicated on the certainty that God loves humans and continues to love humans, sinful or not, as part of a creation engendered in love. In a later writing, Ballou put it like this, your child has fallen into the mire, and its body and its garments are defiled. You cleanse it and array it in clean robes. The question is, do you love your child because you have washed it, or did you wash it because you loved it? So, your kid falls in the mud, you clean the kid off, give him dressed. Do you now like the kid because they're all clean and pretty? Or, and did you hate the kid? when the kid was all muddy? No, that's not how a loving parent, which is what Ballou's conception of God and most many people's is, would do that. So having dismantled these arguments for penal substitutionary atonement to his own satisfaction, Jose Ballou moved on to a doctrine of atonement, which to him made more sense. Atonement as at one meant an action engaged in by humans. 
For Ballou, a theory of atonement must pivot upon the following statement and question. Atonement signifies reconciliation or satisfaction, which is the same. It is a being unreconciled to truth and justice, which needs reconciliation. And it is a dissatisfied being, which needs satisfaction. Therefore, I raise my inquiry on the question, is God the unreconciled or dissatisfied party? Or is it humanity? Is God the unreconciled party or is it humanity? Is God holding a grudge or is that just me? <laughs> it may not matter, but it certainly reframes the notion of atonement if we understand reconciliation as being unneeded between ourselves and the universe, and instead we see it as coming to at one -ment atonement with one another. And if you happen to be a fan of Jesus, it aligns a lot better with his words and actions as outlined in the Gospels than the idea that he thought of his death as payment for an imaginary debt to God. About 800 words ago, I said that Unitarian Universalists may or may not be either Unitarian or Universalist. But as I mentioned, I changed my mind. Unitarianism, which is a belief in the oneness of God as opposed to a Trinitarian view, is definitely something that you use may or may not believe. If you're a modern Christian you you belief in the oneness of God, the essential and powerful humanity of Jesus, those are great, but you can also choose to be a Trinitarian these days. Like I said, I myself love the idea of the Holy Spirit, Ruach in Hebrew, the breath of life that moves over the water and inspires wisdom. The Holy Spirit blows where she will, as one of my favorite professors says, and that language works for me. Maybe not for you, and that's okay. I'm an agnostic, so I use that Holy Spirit language half the time, and the other half of the time I wonder if there's any God at all, much less a God in three bodies. So it can be very confusing. And Unitarianism, yeah, I can take it or I can leave it. Universalism, though. This belief that humans are innately destined and innately worthy to love and to be loved, to save one another, and to be saved by one another. I have to believe that, not only for the sake of the universalism in our faith's name, but for my own spiritual health and sanity. Hosea Ballou was an early adapter and articulator of a deep and abiding faith, faith expressed as hope, just like we talked about last week. Despite all the evidence of humanity's sinful nature, then and now, that faith and hope that tells us humans are beloved is what holds us together. Maybe we're beloved by a creator, maybe we're beloved of the earth as its creations, maybe we're only beloved by our dogs and cats and a few lucky humans, but we're worthy of that and much more even. Our first principle as Unitarian Universalists is that every person has inherent worth and dignity, a core value which I know is shared by those who are here and listening. I have marched and sat and sung. I have heard stories there and I've heard your stories. I know that many of you have spent lifetimes asserting your own humanity and the humanity of those who you love and Every person, when we say that, we mean it. Every person has inherent worth and dignity. All of us, you and me, and all of us. Ballou's reasoning when it came to why he espoused a doctrine of God's infinite love and rejected the idea of a God who punishes infinitely, that reasoning resonates with modern ears. This is what he wrote in 1805. I think I may reasonably argue that Jesus Christ is a being to whom events take place in succession, who hopes and anticipates, and who, 
for the joy set before him of reconciling humankind with God endured the cross and despised the shame. Therefore, until the great work of his mission is completed, I cannot conceive that his happiness will be complete. I do not conceive that one part of human nature can be made perfectly happy while the rest are in misery. Those are not just words for heaven and hell. He went on to write this rather whimsical analogy. Suppose out of the alphabet, all are to be endlessly miserable except for the vowel letters, and the whole alphabet was brought to the knowledge of this truth. They all knew. Surely the vowels would believe they were to be saved, but the consonants would believe that the vowels were going into infinite torments, and the faith of the consonants would be as true a faith as, those of the, as that of the vowels. But how could the consonants enjoy salvation while possessing the truth? And I want to also add, how in the hell could the vowels expect salvation while processing this truth as well. As a privileged, straight-passing, white, college-educated woman, I have access to worldly salvation from many of the world's ills. My belly is full. My roof is sound. My water is drinkable. My job is honestly a great joy, even in a time as challenging as this, perhaps more so. I am saved. I am. I am saved. But can I enjoy my salvation while my neighbor is hungry, while my neighbor drinks tainted water, while my neighbor is homeless, while my neighbor is working three jobs to earn a living wage, while my neighbor is experiencing health crises and dangers because they have to work those three jobs? Can I sit in my salvation even as my neighbor suffers through hell? The answer, of course, is that I can't, and you probably can't either, not here and not in the afterlife. One of the core values that I've seen this congregation engage many times, even in our short time together, is compassion. You do hard work for yourselves and for your neighbors, and it's clear, and it's also life-giving. At its root, the word compassion means to suffer with. Universalism is the recognition that compassion is holy, sacred, divine. Whether you believe the sacred to be created by God or nature or humans, I believe the holiness of compassion in that it is a state to which we must aspire, is clear. Further, I would assert that compassion is a necessary component of any flourishing, healthy community. Unless we can engage in the imaginary act, in the imaginary leap, which places us in the most wretched of circumstances with our neighbors, we cannot create any community, much less the beloved community of which we dream. My hope for salvation is an earthly humanistic hope. It's not strictly spirit, secular. My spirituality is all wrapped up in my hopes for the world. But it's not the salvation Hosea Ballou was talking about, which he described in this way. Then shall truth be victorious and all error flee to eternal night. All death, sorrow, and crying shall be done away. Pains and disorders shall no more be felt. The blessed hand of the once crucified shall wipe tears from off all faces. It's not my cup of tea, but it might be yours. And as Baloo also said, if we agree in brotherly love, there is no disagreement that can do us any injury. But if we do not, no other agreement can do us any good. Shades of, uh, you know, Wesley and all the Unitarians who have been credited with that statement. My universalism is the belief that our compassion, our ability to suffer with, urges us to seek salvation in the here and the now. Being creatures of imagination, we cannot be entirely happy while so much of the world is in pain and misery. 
We cannot be reconciled with our highest good, whatever that may mean in the deeply individual and personal ways we understand it, until we have done our utmost to ease the misery of the world and create communities where all people are free to be born, to live, and to die in plenty, in safety, and in peace. I'll never get there. Neither will you. Most likely, our species will never get there because it's an ideal. But it doesn't matter because compassion, compassion still drives us to seek salvation for our own sakes and for the sake of the whole world. And on that, at least, Hosea and I agree in love. Blessed be. Amen. This is what we do with our faith. Live in this world knowing that we connect, disconnect, and perhaps connect again. Loving despite the hard bargain it demands of us. Doing what we can so that the truth may be safely lived. Measuring our faith by the difference we've made. Building up faith communities to continue after we are gone. At this time, I invite you to give to Community UU Church to support our work together including these online services. You can give online at our website, and this is how. Go to www.communityuuchurch.org. In the right column, click on the blue Donate Now button and fill out the form. You can choose to make an unrestricted gift or contribute to the minister's discretionary fund or our monthly Share the Plate recipient. When you're done, simply click Submit. We thank you for your gifts, given and received. Today's closing words come to us from Barbara Pescun. Because of those who came before, we are. In spite of their failings, we believe. And because of, and in spite of, the horizons of their visions, we too dream. Let us go, remembering to praise, to live in the moment, to love mightily, and to bow to the mystery.
Go in peace and have a wonderful week.